Well, good afternoon and welcome. My name is Ian McLean and I'm President and CEO of the Greater Kitchener Waterloo Chamber of Commerce. And I want to thank you for joining us today and taking time out of your busy schedule to learn how global talent is making a local impact right here in Waterloo Region. We'll hear from some incredible panelists today who will speak about their own experiences and, and share their stories. We hope by the end of the program you'll learn how immigrants and refugees can play uh, a big part in, in your solution to the talent needs you, you face. I want to thank the um, Immigration Partnership Waterloo Region for being our title sponsor today and bringing this topic to the forefront. I'd also like to thank our event sponsors, our friends from MCAP uh, and the Workforce Planning Board. Carol's here somewhere. Where's Carol? There's Carol. Um, for their continued support and to the Delta Waterloo for hosting us here today. I've been uh, honoured to be a member of the Immigration Partnership Waterloo Region since its inception. The roots of uh, the partnership actually started with at the Chamber a number, I don't know, 15 years ago, maybe more. Do that? No, no, no. Uh, but the 2006. So Waterloo Region Immigrant <laughs> I never get the details, right? Uh, but it, it started with, out of something called Waterloo Region Immigrant Employment Network. And Ryan was uh, business-led of recognizing that there was all kinds of talent in this community that was not being uh, utilized by the business community. And it was business coming together saying we need to make sure that we are making those connections to uh, immigrants and refugees and connecting them to the jobs that were here in the community. And it, it has evolved to the Immigration Partnership of Waterloo Region. And I've been honored to be a part of that council since its inception. And I also chair the working group, which is trying to bridge the service providers, immigrants, refugees uh, to business. In particular, one of our focuses is how we connect with small and medium-sized businesses and, and growing businesses in the community. The chamber values our connection with the Workforce Planning Board and our partners corporately and the immigration partnership on this incredibly important issue. And as we get started, I'd just like to take a moment to acknowledge that we do live and work on the traditional territory of the Attawanaran, Anishinaabeg, and Haudenosaunee peoples as we seek a renewed relationship based on the foundation of mutual respect and understanding. I just want to take a moment to uh, recognize a member of our, uh, the Greater KW Chamber of Commerce Board of Directors, Scott Gilfillan from PwC. He's a partner of PwC. He also is on our finance committee, so he keeps, uh, he keeps, tight, he keeps the thumb on us uh, at, at the chamber. But thank you for joining us today, Scott. Please don't forget to visit at the conclusion of the event our community partners at the back. We have Reception House and the Y uh, and KW Multicultural Centre um, to get more information on the programs and services and how they can help you. Uh, in addition, the Immigration Partnership does have uh, online um, the, the One Stop Hub survey and that's uh, something we're, we're working on as a working group of how do we have a place uh, for business and and immigrants and and service providers one-stop shopping so we can make those connections for immigrants to the community with the jobs that are available so we're, we're scoping out what that looks like i really do encourage any of you that particularly in business to uh, to take that back and and um, and uh, uh, put put it's not a long survey but if you take some time it helps us scope what would be useful to the business community so we can make those connections at this time i'd just like to uh, int welcome up and introduce karen spencer karen is doing a fabulous job and has been part of the the uh, the council immigration partnership water region council for a long time but she is now the chair she's also in her day job uh, the Executive Director of Family and Children's Services of Waterloo Region. So she's going to, uh, Karen's going to make a few introductory remarks on behalf of the partnership and then introduce our panel and then we'll have uh, um, a, a fireside chat uh, with our panelists. Karen. Thanks, Ian. It's a, it's a real pleasure to uh, be with you here today. Uh, Ian did talk to you about the history uh, of the Immigration Partnership, where it started. Um, but I'll talk to you a little bit about the Immigration Partnership and what we do now. So uh, we are uh, in our 10th anniversary as the Immigration Partnership, and we are a collaboration of over 60 community um, services, businesses, municipal, post-secondary, and other partners in Waterloo Region all passionately working together to help immigrants and refugees successfully settle, work, and belong. We understand that immigrants sometimes come to Canada for humanitarian reasons, and we also know that Canada needs immigrants to meet our economic and labour needs. 
Our work focuses on helping immigrants and refugees succeed because when newcomers succeed, Waterloo Region thrives. The focus of today's events is on, uh, is, event is on immigration uh, talent and immigration owned businesses in Waterloo Region. And it's especially important to both the Immigration Partnership and Waterloo Region as a whole. And I've certainly had uh, the pleasure of sitting with our uh, panel members uh, over lunch and I'm really excited to hear from all of you. The immigration uh, population in Waterloo Region is larger than the whole of the city of Waterloo and almost as populous as the city of Cambridge. So we were just talking about that growth um, at our table. Statistics Canada data shows that new international migration is the main driver of population growth in Ontario and Waterloo Region. Canada needs new sources of talent to enter the labour force to maintain its high living standards. Immigrants are highly educated, qualified, motivated and entrepreneurial. The Conference Board of Canada reports that between 2018 and 2040, immigration will account for all of Canada's net labour force, force growth and one third of the economic growth rate. Statistics Canada reports find that immigrant-owned businesses are more likely to be job creators than businesses of Canadian-born owners, and that on average, immigrants donate more to charity. Our research has found, other research has found that immigration is a driver of arts and culture in Canada. In short, immigrants and refugees help lift up communities and grow economies. And it is important for us to continue as a community to make way for them to do so to their full capabilities. And now it is my pleasure to introduce our panel. So I'll just tell you a little bit about each of them and then they'll all um, join Ian on the stage. So our first panelist is uh, Mati Bossery co-founder and CMO of Apply Board. Métis leads the sales and marketing teams while fostering growth and scalability across the organization. He is constantly seeking ways to improve Apply Board's service to deliver the best application process. Métis moved to Canada in 2010 from Iran to study business and marketing at Conestoga College in Kitchener. Upon graduation, he founded his own marketing agency, Digital Marketing Associates. After personally experiencing the challenges international students face when applying to study abroad, Métis joined his brother Martin in his mission to make education accessible. Apply Board was launched in 2015 and has revolutionized the in international application process, assisting over 45,000 students from around the world. That's pretty remarkable. Next, we have Dasun Malakarachi, Customer Service Manager at Altero Networks in Waterloo. Dasun moved to Canada in 2017. Prior to this move, he was a seasoned IT professional with 20 years experience performing various roles in engineering, marketing, business operations, and senior management in Sri Lanka. Dasun is passionate about giving back to the community. He volunteers at many events geared towards newcomers to Canada and shares his knowledge and experience with other job seekers and entrepreneurs. He is also getting ready for his Canadian Immigration Consultant License exam conducted by the Immigration Consultants of Canada Regulatory Council. Our final panelist is Heather Bellington. Talent Acquisition Lead at Bonfire Interactive. Heather has been recruiting for the past six years and has both agency and in-house experience from Canada and abroad. In her role at Bonfire, Heather has been instrumental in helping grow the company. In 2018, she helped increase the number of employees by more than double. Uh, she also supported the recruitment effort when Bonfire partnered with Talent Beyond Boundaries to recruit a skilled refugee from abroad for their engineering team. She loves building relationships with candidates and hiring managers to scale teams successfully. When she's not recruiting, she's traveling. We are very pleased to welcome Métis, Dasun, Delsun, and Heather to the stage. Well, thank you, Karen, and, and I, I, I can see, or I hope you see why I'm so excited about, uh, about the panel today. I think we're gonna hear 
and I think to set the stage um, that we need to be, Canada and this, this province and this region need to be seen to be a choice, a, a place of choice for immigrants, uh, or for Canada's uh, um, f future economic growth. That we have to understand that we have to leverage the, the education system we have here, in particular Conestoga, Waterloo and Laurier and what that means for bringing in uh, immigrants and, and newcomers to our country and the talent that they bring. And for business, business here and across the province, across the country needs world-class talent. Whether that's newcomers or Canadian, native born Canadians, we need the talent that, uh, uh, every business needs the talent to fuel growth. So uh, I think to, to start off, and, we, and our, we had a conference call a couple of weeks ago to, to make sure we were all on the same page, and I, and I, I don't often do this, but I, I, I thought we would start with an open-ended question, because each of your stories is a, a little unique, whether from your business or, or not. So maybe uh, starting with you, Mehdi, um, just a, a, a short kind of, give us a flavor of how you actually got started in, 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 with, uh, with the Ply Board. Uh, thank you so much, guys, for having us here. Thanks for the intro. I'm trying to not repeat uh, what has been heard. Uh, so, um, me and actually my brother, we all came as international students to Canada, and the, one of the main reasons for us was from the first day, we would have seen that we will be living in Canada as eventually in, as immigrants. So what we decided to do is back home, rather than studying our undergrad, we came here. It was a really hard process for us, uh, specifically coming from Iran, to get the visa, do the process, everything. So then uh, fast forward after our education finished, this was always in our mind that, you know, like we could have been different path. We could have stayed in Iran. We could have been uh, totally somewhere else. I don't know whether uh, we would be as successful as that uh, we are or not. So. We were like thinking how we would be able to help others, how we would be able to do and make the path much easier for international students. So a lot of people might not know, we have about uh, 500, half a million international students right now in Canada that they're studying. International students pay three times more than domestic students. And it's not loan, it's not, uh, government of Canada does not pay for them. So it is extremely uh, finance and economic uh, this good decision for schools and economy uh, for uh, government of Canada. Right now, uh, international students contribute about $15 billion to economy of Canada, which has put us second after nature and natural resources that Canada has. So because of all those impacts that international students, we knew that it's uh, good for economy, good for Canada, and it's good for students. Then we started at Plyboard 2015, making some sort of online platform, let's say Expedia. If anyone uses Expedia, we want to, let's say, let's come up with Expedia for international students. They put their whatever they need to know, and we match them with the school. And now till today, as a uh, uh, Karen said we have helped over 45,000 uh, international students. Canada is our primary market, and we successfully pl placed more than 10,000 students so far in our Canadian uh, partner schools, which indirectly that creates more than 3,000 jobs in Canada. That's amazing. Dasun, uh, what I found interesting about your story is that you did a lot of research before you ever decided where you were going to come, whether whether Canada was so talk a little bit about that in, in terms of, and we'll get into some of the other pieces you're doing, but but talk a little bit about how you uh, did the pre-networking, if you were, and decided that Canada was where you wanted to come. Okay, uh, <clears throat> thank you very much for having me. Thank you very much for the introduction, and uh, welcome everybody. Uh, so um, so to answer the question, uh, so. When I completed my MBA, this is fast forward from my everything I did in my 20 years career. So I, after I did my MBA, I thought, okay, living in the same country for 37 years now, what's gonna be my next challenge? So I had a chat with my wife and said, okay, we gotta pick a country and just go. So what's, what's, what's gonna be the challenge? Because we wanna go, we, we, by, by that time we had a kid as well. So it's a family of three. So what's gonna be our challenge? Uh, so pick a country and then I had the opportunity to go to Australia and also to Canada or UK or any country. Because everywhere I have relatives and friends and you know, but but the real challenge is in Canada. 
because the the weather is challenging <laughs> there itself. I would have yeah, <laughs> and that's what everybody suggested. The, the majority suggested to go to Australia because it's more closer to the the weather experience. But I said, so what's the challenge in there? I'm trying to get out of my comfort zone here. Help me on that. So that's how I picked uh, Canada uh, over Australia. And then uh, I did my research. So where should I go? Pinpoint. Canada is the second largest country in the world. Where should we go? And then, OK, let's be practical as well. I need to survive once I go there, right? So I need to find a job in my profession, in my area. So that's where I can. Uh, set my feet in and then uh, start my career and you know do all those things that I do right now. So then I start researching. I actually uh, mainly I use the internet and then I spoke to a couple of friends as well, international students uh, from the University of Waterloo and then also I, uh, I, uh, uh, I started networking then and there itself while I was in Sri Lanka. And then I, st I picked like, I didn't like Toronto. I have no offense to Torontonians, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't like Toronto because I was from a city in Sri Lanka, like hustle bustle, I don't want that. But I wanted to have a not so boring, but a balanced life and to raise my kids here as well. So that's why I picked Kitchener Waterloo area because this has the tech rich uh, entrepreneurial spirit in the industry, as well as the vibrant uh, multiculturalism, plus welcomeness, uh, welcoming, and then also uh, uh, gave me the uh, opportunity to start my life here. So that's amazing. And, that's and as how. a chamber, we always like to hear people think that networking is a good thing to do. So so that's great. But it also, I think, speaks to when we were talking on the phone, how connected the world is now. That you're able to do research and understand what, what this community was like. I used to follow YouTubers, like all kind of YouTubers, truck drivers to celebrities, to everybody who like connected to Kitchener Waterloo area, because they, they roam around the roads with their cameras on and explaining about, oh, this is a very nasty city, don't go there, and stuff like that. And they, oh, this is a beautiful city, this like, <laughs> population is that, and this. So my, my wife and my some relatives thought I was crazy because watching truck drivers, dash cams, and listening to my. <laughs> But that research paid off. <laughs> um, Heather, uh, we'll, get, we'll get into Talent Beyond Borders, but maybe talk a little bit about, about Bonfire and the growth and, and, and why this, be, that, that, we'll get to why that was important, but talk about the growth of your company and, and, and how you kind of came to say you had talent issues. Um, talk about the, your business a little bit and why you've gra um, gravitated towards the importance of immigrants and refugees as part of your employee mix. So uh, Bonfire started in 2012. Um, so since then, uh, we've gone to Y Combinator, uh, got our Series A funding from Battery Ventures, and just recently were acquired by a special interest group. Uh, so we're a procurement and sourcing software that really helps um, buyers and vendors collaborate to make those high consequence purchasing decisions with more certainty. So um, really what goes on behind the scenes with municipalities, uh, government and state agencies, our taxpayer dollars, how they're deciding uh, what to invest in is what we help facilitate. Um, so when I joined, it was the end of 2017. Very recently after our Series A funding, we were just shy of 40 people, and we had a mandate to double the team in size. Um, so it was daunting. I was the first recruiter. Um, you know, how are we going to do this? I was pretty upfront, and I wasn't sure. <laughs> it was a pretty lofty goal. Um, but what's great is we've been, it's always been challenging the industry. We're getting procurement people to adopt to technology that are averse to change. So why we decided to take this approach to talent. Um, it came up, a member of our executive team did immigrate from Syria when he was a teenager. So this is an option, this was an opportunity to do something that really meant a lot to him. And when he approached the, the CEO, you know, it's never been done before. And he was like, let's do it. Uh, we weren't afraid of the challenge. So we were the first company just two months ago to bring Mohammed, a full stack developer, to our engineering team. So it was a lengthy process. We both learned through it, Talent Beyond Boundaries and Bonfire. But I just think the approach that we take to we're always up for a challenge, we could say that, is, is why we decided to, to take advantage of the opportunity. Mehdi, um, what were some of the challenges coming here as a student, new, new country? Um, um, so 
the challenges of a student as a student, uh, but then also as an entrepreneur. What, what were some of those things that, that uh, were there some commonalities or were there different sets of challenges from your time as a student and, and then into, into being an entrepreneur? Uh, that's actually so good question. So I tell this story for all of you guys. So I remember it was second week that I was in Canada and I went to uh, Food Basic. So I bought something, the cashier said something, and I said yes. And she said yes? <laughs> All I said was like no. So where I'm going by this, I couldn't speak a word of English. <laughs> so I still, to, till today, I don't know what she said. <laughs> <laughs> so I really want to find her and say, why did you tell me that I said no or yes, you know? So I think the first challenge for anyone coming here, specifically if you in your country you don't speak English, would be language, right? So you're coming somewhere that no one will really understand you. And like I came when I was uh, almost 18, so for me it was like I don't want to hang out with my comedy. I want to actually be in Canadian society. I want to be with the people, so be part of it. So that was the biggest challenge coming and then going to a school. And that time, I was the only international student in 110 people in business marketing. So even people didn't, you were really kind of alien to them. You're like, why, what is international students? They would not get it. So that was like very challenging. I'm so happy that's been solved for a lot of international students today because the number has increased a lot. But when you come and then you start and always when you want to work everywhere, when you come to the company, when you want to do fundraising, you always have that flag on top of you. I will never forget, we were doing fundraising in our Series A. And we had an investor says, three Iranian brothers, not at that time uh, citizen, why would I give my money to you guys? If the business is not going, you guys can take the money and go back home. So that's something that, what are you gonna respond to that? Like, oh no, I built my life here, I'm gonna. So there are definitely challenges when you're not. Uh, but uh, luckily we overcome all those challenges and now it's much easier because we build our company based on very diversified people. We, when we bring the people that we don't have that nationality, we actually celebrate it. So people know that actually diversity means a lot to our company. And I think it's gradual challenges. I'm very lucky that compared to eight years ago, now society's changed. Now we see other people coming in. So, and more people more accepted it. Like uh, people my age are totally okay with that. So, and now it's kind of gradual, it's getting better and better. Um, the soon, you talked about the before part, the YouTube dash cams and everything else of where you're going to be. But talk about the networking when you got here, because I think that's, I mean, and we'll talk uh, about what you're doing now, but when you got here, how was networking one of those things that helped you get your first job and make those connections? Talk about, about that as an important part, because it's, uh, it's something that we, we do talk about for, for everyone. In, in, in any new setting, networking is important. Talk about that. Yes. Uh, <clears throat> So let me rewind back to 20 years ago, uh, right after my high school in 1999. Okay, don't guess my age now. Uh, 1999, so right after my high school, uh, I got my first computer as a gift from my father. And then I was a little bit good at that. I can do graphics designing and do some typesetting and stuff. So, uh, so my father was a head of a village at that time, so he had a very good network. And, and at that time, the civil war was there in Sri Lanka. And I was actually from a rural area where the civil war was like, I can hear the bombs sort of area. And then at that time, we had an army uh, camp, like a military camp there, closer to that. And they wanted a computer operator. And the head of that uh, army camp came to my dad to get, us, get his personal firearms certified detail level stuff, but still, that's the connection there. So when he came, he's the head of that, uh, that uh, training facility. And then my dad said, my son is a little bit, you know, he knows a little bit of computing. Do you have any openings like for computer operators there? But not in the military. He used to, <laughs> <laughs> I don't want him to get killed. He's my only son. So, <laughs> so he said, send him tomorrow. That's how I got my first job as a computer operator in the Sri Lanka army. And, that's because of my dad's network. I didn't do anything. I was lucky because my dad had a good network. So after that, all the jobs I did, 
all the jobs, and then I joined a university as a system administrator, and then after that, I, I became a system engineer in a private company, and then I became a senior manager. Every step I went through my career was through networking. So I can't, uh, uh, I can't stress about that, like networking is the number one thing, uh, and it should be genuine networking. Like it shouldn't be just to get a job. It's the genuine human interaction and human connection relationships I built uh, during my entire life. Uh, and then uh, helping as well, contributing back, not just uh, try to get something from your network, just also to contribute back, may help me to uh, move out, move from the ladder. And then also, when I came here, before I come, I started networking with companies in, because I, I pick Kitchener Waterloo area. That's my niche. I, I'm not gonna de, uh, apply for any other area. So I, re, I, I, through Indeed and through Communa Tech website and through many other uh, uh, website, uh, websites, I pick companies in Kitchener Waterloo area. I think I have sent close to uh, 50 applications while I was in Sri Lanka. But in the cover letter, I always mention I'm still in Sri Lanka. I know you have to do a certain immigration process to hire a foreign national, but you don't have to do that. I'm on my process as a skilled immigrant to move into Canada. Once I am here, I will talk to you again if the, uh, the, the role is available. Actually, I got replies from a couple of companies as well. It was a yes for me, like, because <laughs> yes, they replied back. And after that, once I came here, so I had a list of companies I applied while I was in Sri Lanka. And then I went through the website again, and I started calling them and say, hey, I'm here now. Would you interested to have a chat with me? So I got three interviews right off like one month uh, after I came here. I got three interviews. Uh, and uh, one company, actually, uh, the hiring manager was waiting for me to come, sort of interested. And then she hired me like, within two weeks. And that's how I got my first job at Sortable. Uh, it's a nice, uh, very uh, exciting and uh, mm -hmm. challenging IT company in uh, King Street in Kitchener. So that's how I could set my feet in uh, Kitchener Waterloo area and start my journey. Great. Uh, Heather, talk a little bit about the Talent Beyond Boundaries program. That's something that uh, Bonfire has really taken advantage of. Um, but what motivated Bonfire to, to get connected with that program uh, in terms of talenting specifically for uh, foreign, foreign, uh, foreign talent? So like I mentioned, it was a cause that was really important to our director of customer experience because he, being a Syrian immigrant himself and his family, so he had a connection with Talent Beyond Boundaries. And uh, we met with uh, Dana, who's the director of Canadian operations. Um, and they were very open about, you know, we haven't done this before, but we do want to connect you with talent um, in hopes that we'll be able to bring them over. Um, so to be honest, at first I was like, wow, this is a big undertaking considering we don't even have a local talent strategy and <laughs> or recognition. Um, so I was like, maybe this isn't the first priority, like I was a bit hesitant. But then, to be honest, working with Dana and uh, getting to know Talent Beyond Boundaries and how much work they do, we treated it very similar to our standard recruitment process for an engineer. So they presented us with um, probably 10 or 15 engineers. They have people on the ground in Lebanon that are interviewing them, assessing their skill set. And then they send you their resumes. Um, so then you're able to you know, assess the resume as you normally would, set up Skype interviews, start talking to these people, getting to know them. Um, and that's how we met Mohammed. And he went through the exact same um, engineering skills assessment. Um, and it was, a, it was a long process. But in the end, it was worth it. At the beginning days, it's like, will he ever get here? Um, but Talent Beyond Boundaries does a lot of the heavy lifting. They have pro bono, pro bono lawyers that are with you every step of the way. So I didn't have to do any of that work. I just was basically facilitating that. Um, and then our director of engineering was heavily involved in the interview process. So they really give you the access to talent um, and set you up for success. And we learned together, especially when Muhammad got here, what would you tell other employers? Um, that kind of thing. So it was a learning experience for everybody, but it worked out extremely well. Great. 
Mehdi, um, you talked about your Series A and, and getting that, that first investment as a, as a true startup with uh, right off the get-go with probably an idea more than a, more than a business. Uh, you recently, and I think Karen mentioned it, just got uh, $55 million in your Series B. Um, so maybe talk a little bit how it's gotten easier with a company that's actually up and running and, and more, um, you know, I, I guess, openness to uh, immigrant entrepreneurs, especially here in the region. But also, what does that mean for your future growth, both, both locally, but also how you intend to reach out? Uh, so I guess the first one I start with how that fund's gonna help apply for it. So when we started, I actually purchased the house here. So we really thinking always keeping the headquarter in Waterloo, even though a lot of uh, other entrepreneurs suggested, why would you not guys move to Toronto, change it or to San Francisco? Now you have the money, you can do whatever you want. And to be fact, if you want to be fair, the talent pool even Toronto. It's way bigger than Waterloo, or the talent pool to San Francisco is not comparable to Toronto. When you're hiring just people or good people, Kitchener Water is great. When you want to hire someone that took the company from under $50 million revenue to half a billion dollar revenue, there's no one in Kitchener Waterloo. Like we really, the Kitchener Water has one success, which was BlackBerry, kind of success. So. What after that, then it's Shopify. So we've seen decade by decade. So while we're trying to really focus on actually bringing uh, talents from us, so we have brought talent from Russia to our company. We have brought talent from Egypt. And we have sat down with the Minister of Immigration two times and explaining why is that important. And community is working amazingly toward of that, that attract more talent uh, to KW area. And with that fund, we're hoping that we can be able to bring really the talent and t telling to people that the kitchen water has a lot more advantage than uh, Toronto, just as a cost and everything. And then growing the company. Right now, we're about 184, estimating to be over 250 by the end of this year. And uh, we're trying to more be more optimization. Right now, the risk is so much more. When you are 10 people, if the idea doesn't work, you just pivot to something else. When you have 250 people, responsibility 500,000, then there is no risk. You have to take everything, make sure everything is just doing fine. And uh, I, I hope that would be able to uh, help the community as well. I think like more companies coming here, that attracts more uh, people and uh, investors to come. Right now, Kitchener Water has been lucky that there is more interest here compared to Montreal or Vancouver or Toronto in terms of investment. And like, as example, like us, we, the whole money came from the state. So from venture capital from the state, that's how those uh, investment can be very added value to the city. Great. This soon, um, and you talked about um, that you'd done some, some you had some uh, um, inquiries about or connections about your first job when you got here and you, you landed a job fairly, fairly quickly. But you must have had challenges when you actually got here. Um, so what were some of those challenges when you, when you physically got here? And what were some of the opportunities um, that, that have arisen as, you, as you've grown into your career locally here? Yeah. Um, so, uh, so like I said, uh, when I came here, like, so during my immigration process, uh, my wife got pregnant and we had another kid. <laughs> so it wasn't the family of three anymore, it was family of four. At the time of apply, it was family of three, but when we moved, it was family of four. So the challenge got really big. So even though I can, I can like take a lot of challenges right now, I have to think about, okay, now I have to take care of my family as well. So despite all the research I did, I actually had a, have a finalized three apartments uh, to come and look right after I came. I booked for a book and Airbnb for 10 days because right after I come, I don't have credit history. And not any, many lenders are willing to rent me. I didn't have a job. And so how to uh, overcome those challenges was to show that I have proof of funds. So that's like something we have to show when you immigrate from, uh, from other countries. Uh, actually, I had to show closer to 35,000 Canadian dollars in my bank account 
to move here, right? And then uh, uh, once I, I have to like show that I have money because I don't have credit history. I, so that was a challenge. And during that 10 days of time which I, bo I, I booked the Airbnb, I got to finalize one of those three apartment blocks. So luckily, uh, one of those apartments, uh, guys, like they said, OK, show me your bank account. Then we'll forget about your credit history. And then I was able to get that one bedroom apartment. And we moved in. And it, we had like a three-story uh, house with uh, 40 perch land. <laughs> with a backyard <laughs> opening to the forest. So that's the, fa the f uh, background we had in Sri Lanka. And then here, to a one-bedroom apartment with two kids. So uh, that's how, like, that's the challenge I had in the very first time. And then, but since I networked while I was in Sri Lanka, that's why I wanted to, like, tell any, any, anybody who's trying to immigrate to Canada from an, any other country, I, if, if they talk to me while they are in their home country, I would say, hey, don't just come to Pearson Airport and wander around, where should I go, <laughs> right? Instead of that, do your homework. At least live, virtually live in Canada, where you want to live for six months. That's what I did. I took a break from my, my work in Sri Lanka for six months before I came, and I just reset myself, because I'm not going to be a senior manager anymore. Once you, once you go there, you've got to start from zero. So I have to make my mindset. I have to let go my ego. I have to let go all my professional uh, uh, the, the, the background I had. Because you are starting fresh. I felt like a high school student right away. But I didn't try to do any of those, you know, <laughs> high school <laughs> kids does. <laughs> Married with kids. But uh, I felt that energy once I came here. So I got to start from somewhere. So I had, that's the challenge. The other challenge was that mental challenge. You got to reset your mm -hmm. mindset. Uh, that's what I tell who's trying to come or are trying to apply from uh, their home country. I want to send that message. So there are, there are, I, 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 can, I can expect like there will be like immigration consultants and, uh, and immigration lawyers here in the audience. Uh, raise your hand if there is any. Yeah. No? No, there's some. Okay. Here. If you have connections with those who bring talent mm -hmm. from here, uh, from other countries to here, let them know, educate them on that aspect. Research where you want to go, how do you want to live, values and uh, the rituals and cultural uh, uh, things that uh, the area that you are going in, how you can integrate properly into that area. So that understanding and the education prior to land is very important, and that's over, help me to overcome a lot of challenges. Uh, but I had few challenges like that and landed my first job and let go of that job after seven months. Yep, that kind of challenge also happened, mm -hmm. but uh, that's where I started and, you know. Heather, so you talked about uh, the, 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 the success you've had through the uh, Talent Beyond Boundaries. Um, I'm, I'm wondering, uh, how, how has Bonfire contributed to that program being even more, more useful? I mean, you, you've, you obviously have its two-way communication. What, when you first started, it would have been foreign to you about using the program. How has it evolved, or how have you contributed to making that, that program more meaningful to you and, and more useful and maybe speeding the process? What, what are some of the things you've taken away from a, from a corporate perspective of how you can make the, you've helped make the program better? So I think an important thing to note is it did catch a lot of attention when uh, Mohammed was, when it became real and he got his um, visa and was able to come and quite a few news outlets uh, covered it, but that was never the intention or reason why we were doing it uh, to get Bonfire's name out there. It was for the greater good so we could help refugees come to Canada. Um, so. Uh, our director, our sorry, VP of Engineering, just spoke at True North today and said mm -hmm. they've been able to get five commitments from four or five other tech companies in town to hire skilled refugees. So that wouldn't have happened without us being the first and kind of the pilot project. Um, we w might have been the first globally, but Australia beat us by about six weeks, I think. So. I think just being able to be the first person and be able to speak from experience what it was like and offer feedback. Um, Talent Beyond Boundaries was always open and still is to any feedback um, that we have. Um, I was just talking to Dana today about some of uh, the things and you know understanding how Mohammed's um, getting on in Canada, but um, and just understanding 
you know, tips I would give to other employees because it's interesting what you brought up about, um, you know, having money in your bank account. That's why refugees can't access this global work stream. Um, it's a Ontario nominee immigration program. So that's waived. They don't need that money because that's really what holds back uh, refugees. So being able to give them a pathway where they're going to be able to work and uh, make money where they don't have that barrier to entry. It's really creating pathways and I really feel like bonfires created more pathways for refugees to come work work here. Well, b being an early adopter and being the first is, is, is leadership. So uh, congratulations to Bonfire. Uh, Betty, um, you you talked about uh, having I think it's it, I think we talked about thirty different nationalities in your office place right now, um, forty five thousand uh, uh, clients if you will. What from your perspective is it, or expand on what what are the benefits of that diversity in your workplace? You talked a little bit about it, but drill down. What does that mean from a corporate perspective? And then when when you, in the work that you're doing, how does that how does that translate to the clients you hope to have? Uh, I always uh, tell any entrepreneur when they start, I said the first things you do, war change. We're not low, no more living in 10 years ago or 20 years ago. Now we have people that you're going to target from everywhere that it's going to be your target at the end. So for us, we're targeting students all around the world. And we can't just think one way or one mindset of like, I'm Iranian, for Iranian, this is the culture. No, it's very different than Chinese, very different than Indian, very different than any other nationality. So for us, that was the biggest value that when you bring people from Brazil, uh, Thailand, and they start talking together, you see the ideas start mixing. You see the ideas that comes out that it's address multiple nationalities. And moreover, when we are starting a nationality or advertisement to a new country, we already have people that they came from that. So that's a huge value added to our business. But I think that's to every business. Because right now, even if you're a local company and you're advertising or promoting your business, mm -hmm. look at in this room, how many people are like probably are immigrant or second generation. So it is extremely important to bring them. And at the same time, we kind of wanted from the first day to be one of the companies in Kitchener Waterloo that we're never going to be afraid of hiring uh, people that are not born here. I never forget one of my early uh, directors. Uh, we had people speaking their language. I myself, when I talk with my brothers in the company, we speak Farsi. And my director was always annoyed. And he's born here. It's like, this is disrespectful. You should just uh, speak English because you're environmental. And we stood on it. I said, no, they can uh, speak the language that they're comfortable. Now you walk in the office. Our office is 33,000 square feet. So by the time I leave the kitchen, I want to get to my desk. Probably I hear four different languages. <laughs> so well, that's great. Um, this soon, you, you, we, we talked on the phone when we were getting ready for this about your approach to community integration, that, that you're here now, um, that, that that was an important part of, of, of how, you know, it's, it, I guess it's part of networking in the grand scheme. But talk about community integration. What, what, what do you suggest to, to newcomers in terms of um, using that, getting involved in the community and being, being part of the community as being um, uh, an important aspect of, of your transition here to the country? And, and what, what can local business do to support that, right, it, 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 to, to really encourage newcomers to integrate into the community? Yes. Uh, <clears throat> so I, I have to mention, like, um, after I came here and then when I was in my job search and when I was applying for the companies I was networking with, uh, the, the third day of my, after I land, and I, I, I was in the Airbnb still, and then I went to Kitchener Waterloo Multicultural Center. I think, raise your hand, guys, from there. See there, there. Hello, how are you? So, <laughs> so I went that went went there, and I met Caitlin and um, Minyong, and I can't remember the others, name, but I'm sorry, yeah, few other uh, uh, officials from there. And then I was sitting next to a group of people who was discussing about their challenges and stuff. So, I went to the multicultural center because I was expecting to have multicultural people there, and and and. I really had that experience there as well. And then while I was sitting on that 
rather than what's in it for me, I was always thinking, how can I contribute? I, I, I wanted to answer somebody's question. Like if somebody say, oh no, I'm so desperate, I don't know what to do, I, I don't have a job and I don't know what to do. After that group session, I actually asked him like, let's go have a coffee, I have something for you. And then I didn't have anything at that time. <laughs> Over, at all. Make it till you make it. Yeah, I just, I just went there out there and I said, I just evaluate him like kind of an interview him, like saying, okay, what did you do while, I was, while you was there? And this is your transferable skill. You are not an accountant here, but you are good at numbers. So become an accounts clerk. Don't target the senior account position. Become an account clerk or become a cashier first. And then show your number skills. It's totally different how you prepare taxes in Ecuador and in Canada. So just help them to like reset their mindset because I knew that's gonna help me as well because I'm talking to myself there itself while I'm talking to him. So uh, basically, um, uh, so uh, that helped me to start uh, the networking here in Canada. And then I was invited uh, to participate in Conestoga College. Hi. Uh, <laughs> so uh, employment, uh, employment Canada, right? Immigrant, yeah, so in that, uh, uh, they hosted a couple of events, mm -hmm. and then I was invited as, the, as a panelist uh, in those uh, events because the contribution I did uh, with uh, Multicultural Center. Mm -hmm. And I, but after that, I was invited to uh, speak about my journey in the Global Skill Conference. Right. Likewise, I got opportunity to share my story and inspire many people out there and many who willing to come here uh, because I was I was contributing back to the community and I wanted, wanted to integrate into the community rather than just uh, uh, get aside and meet my own Sri Lankan community and have a pity party there, oh no, I don't have anything and crying. And instead of doing that, like going and talking to different uh, cultures and then mixing up with different uh, mm -hmm. friends, that helped me to uh, integrate properly and expand my network and even uh, land on my job after after laying getting laid off from my first job even to land on the particular mm -hmm. job I do right now it's all from the networking I did after I came because I'd never stopped networking even though I got a job some most people what they do is like they stop networking right after they land on a job they're comfortable I got a job stop networking that's the that's one of the other mistakes they do as well they have to keep contributing go out show up uh, on events and uh, Contribute. Great. Yeah, that's um, Heather, and we often talk about this when we're with the partnership and our working uh, working group. Um, are there similarities or differences in the hiring and onboarding process? So you talked about a little few. Obviously, you're coming from another place, but um, w talk about what those differences are or what the similarities are. And and because I mean, what we what we try and communicate is that there's there's challenges and opportunities with every hire you have. So talk about that in, the, in this context. So I think there is quite a bit more to consider uh, just because Mohammed had never been to Canada, didn't have his bearings. Um, so we wanted to provide as much support as possible. It wasn't necessarily a requirement, but I've traveled quite a bit and lived abroad. So I was definitely conscious of some things that would help make the transition easier. But first and foremost, um, you know, we decided that he'd start two weeks like mutually with him two weeks after uh, he got here so he'd be able to get set up. Um, but just providing him with the relevant information, uh, Talent Beyond Boundaries created the, a, a great um, reference document of what we should be considering. But also meeting him at the airport, we found temporary accommodation um, for him for about five weeks so he could find an apartment uh, to transition. But you know, small things that I wouldn't do for just anybody else that we hired, but you know, I was like, I'm not even sure he's coming with a laptop. Like, it's going to be very hard for him to set up or do anything in two weeks without it. Let's make sure the laptop's at the Airbnb when he gets there. Um, things like let's stock his fridge because will he have money? Will he have access to credit? Um, are things that I took uh, the team took into consideration and. Our team was really great at Bonfire without really asking. People stepped up to the plate. 
taking him to see apartments, taking him to Tim Hortons initially. Um, so I think just going obviously that bit extra mile, but also we did have um, another group come in just to kind of prepare people for what to talk about and what to expect. Because I think sometimes people just don't want to say the wrong thing. Um, that prepared everybody, but everybody was so excited to have Muhammad join the team and it's was just jumped in and just showed him the city and a lot a lot of things that you're mentioning that you went through. I was like, you've got such a great attitude and we've we got Mohammed was so self sufficient as well. I was almost surprised I was expecting to take mm -hmm. him to a lot of different places. So it was obviously different than a standard hire, but a lot of the things were the same. Um, but well, going the extra mile, you, you do that for any employee, depending on who they, uh, who they are and what their needs are. So that's great to hear. Um, Mehdi, and one of the things we always talk about is that there are, and you talked about it, there are thousands and thousands of, of uh, um, uh, international students here in the region of Waterloo. Uh, there's talent shortages in every sector. You know, it's in, in tech, it's in, uh, it's in manufacturing, it's in services. Take your pick. There's jobs open in this community. And one of the things the business community and, and community organizations talk about is how do we keep international students here uh, once they once they're done their training or their 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 um, their studies is part of that that we we got to keep um, creating that environment that entrepreneurial environment where people can start that business and be supported in doing that. But but talk a little bit about that because that's a, that's a that's a, a an advantage for us here in the region of Waterloo that we really have to leverage. What would be your advice on how we keep them here? Uh, it is actually a great question, and uh, one of the always we sit and we talk with the official people in government, and we emphasize actually how important is keeping international students. First, they went to the education, Canadian education. So you bringing someone that is just fresh today to the country compared to someone being here for four years, two years, whatever. So they already know the culture. They already know the. Uh, Society, so it's a definitive value of keeping in these international students. So there are a lot of things that can be done, but I don't see that necessary doing it right now. Getting the job is not as easy as for international students. A lot of people are the first thing they ask. Oh, you don't have a scene number. They're not going to ask, how can you get the scene number? Because it's not an easy process. You are international students now. You have to get a three years work permit. Is another applying for immigration, dealing with the immigration. It's not easy to deal with any sort of immigration uh, staff. So through that, if you can help the students and be open to that, you know what? It's OK. I know legally you can work even though I don't have the knowledge of it, I will help you and get the job. It's fine that you're international. But I think it's getting better, but still I've seen people when they are applying as international students in their cover letter, they actually write it, I'm international students, I hope that's fine. That's not a good sign. That's, that means the other people told them, why are international students, right? That should never be like it's the same as gender. We should never say what is our status in Canada to get a job. You know, as long as you're legal, you can't work, should be there. And the other thing I think Kitchener Water is getting there that people see that as advantage of living and the amount of jobs creating here. Those gonna help, but definitely through the path and helping your students that, okay, there is now you're here, let's keep you till and go through the path with you. And it's going to happen from uh, entrepreneurs first and the uh, city to actually put the center to help. Career centers in colleges, university, they're good. But really, before the students get the job, there is something missing right now. OK, that's, that's helpful. I think that, that there's one of our surveys for the, uh, for the One Stop Hub right there. We just completed that on the stage here. Thank you. Um, Heather, last question to you. Um, what advice would you give to employers that are looking to hire immigrants and refugees? And obviously, we've talked about the, the talent beyond boundaries, but what, what would be some of those takeaways uh, or, or, you know, suggestions to any, any business? Because we all have talent needs. What would, what would be those things that you, would, uh, that you would tell them are the things that they should be thinking about? 
So I think there's so many resources that you can leverage. Um, I mean, we leverage Talent Beyond Boundaries, but there's so many experts in the field that can really help you that you don't have to do it alone um, is something I would say because I think it seems daunting and there's a lot of unknowns and a lot of applications, but there's experts that are already in the field that can you can leverage their knowledge or even companies that have gone through it before um, are there to help. So I think don't think that you have to do it alone and kind of reinvent the wheel. There's so many programs, mm -hmm. there's so many people that want to help and are passionate about this that um, leverage those resources because it makes it a lot easier. I mean, we would not be where we were, where we are today and have Mohammed on the team if it wasn't for Talent Beyond Boundaries. And it's just such a great partnership that why wouldn't you take advantage of that, right? Um, and I think there's a lot of other um, opportunities. And I think at the end of the day, it's keeping an open mind, right? Because there's a lot of different nuances when people apply to jobs necessarily if they're new to Canada. It's don't just rule them out because their resume is formatted differently. We really have to be conscious of those unconscious bias and and know how rich diversity makes a company and keep that front and center it's just being really self-aware mm -hmm. of how it can help a company rather than look at it as a negative or detractor um, like I'm really inspired by what you guys have said here today um, but I would just going back to the basics and just having an open mind is probably number one good Okay, I think we're just about at time, but as soon um, you, you, in your introduction, you're you're about ready to write the Canadian Immigration Consultant License Exam. Uh, quickly, what is that, and then why do you feel it's important to help others along this journey? I mean, you've, I think we got a sense of that, but uh, this this uh, this exam will help you along that path. Talk a little bit about that. So, uh, so uh, in order to uh, help or to charge a fee. Uh, to to work on an immigration uh, case, you got to have that uh, uh, license from the ICCRC, and that's the uh, so that's one reason I am doing that exam to obtain that license so I can officially uh, help uh, people. And and the the second thing is I I went through the entire immigration process for my application with a consultant. And then, but I didn't leave it on consultant's hand, just, okay, here's the documents, do your thing. I was going through each and every steps with her, scrutinizing my work, and then, and then make sure everything is in order. And that gave me a very good foundation to, to get an idea about how complex this immigration process is. And I know why it is complex as well. It can improve a lot, but I know why it is complex as well, because there are people who can abuse the system as well. So it, there are certain restrictions that should be in place, but those restrictions also will be a very big, I mean, not a, it's a bottleneck for uh, those who genuinely want to come and contribute in, in, a, in a country and help the Canadian economy to grow. So I see that bottleneck there. So I thought, yes, by doing this, I will have the official license to help anybody, but also my my value addition for that is not just to prepare your documents, but also to prepare your mindset and also to help you when you land here. How soon you can set to success and how soon you can integrate into the into the society, into the culture, and into the job market. Everything and also I wanted to like give them the hard truth of. Uh, uh, unemployment situations. So how to cope up with that? Because I went through, I had my job and I was let go and I was even invited in one of the uh, career uh, events to talk about how you cope up with the unemployment situation. So because that's something you don't get to learn in, in schools. And <laughs> you never learn that things in school. It's life's experience. And I wanted to share that experience before they come, because then they can set their mind and also save for their rainy days while they have the job, and also expect, OK, something can go south. So <laughs> expect that, and always be ready for that kind of thing. And then that everything can I can add that as a value addition to my, my, uh, to my uh, uh, license and mm -hmm. uh, to provide that service to any of the clients that I might have in future. So that's the idea of doing that, and also help them to pick an area based on their professional experience, their their uh, activity needs, kind of thing, and then help them to you know because this is a big country and there are many provinces mm -hmm. and many cities that they can settle, not just Toronto. 
<laughs> not just uh, or even like Kitchener Water, not just one city. They they have. Some people ask me like, oh, you live in uh, Toronto? They all think like Canada is Toronto. <laughs> <laughs> they don't you know, like they don't know uh, any other place or oh, Vancouver. And that's the kind of situation what outside uh, people have. So I want to change that mindset as much as possible and help them to move here and set them to success as soon as possible and avoid mistakes and you know help them as much as possible. That's the whole idea. That is wonderful. We're out of time. I, I do want to uh, thank each of you uh, for your uh, um, time today and your willingness to share your story. As a token of our appreciation on behalf of the Greater Kitchen Water Chamber of Commerce, the Immigration Partnership and our sponsors, I'd like to present you with a book and it's called County Roots Global Reach. It's a book we did which is the, the community as a whole, the cities and the township from an economic development business perspective. It's, uh, we hope you'll, uh, you'll accept this as a token of our appreciation. Thank you. You can, you guys can sit just, uh, just a couple of minutes if you want to. You can sit or, or you can go down. Get. <laughs> Standing would be awkward, so. <clears throat> Listen, just before we can conclude, it, it's been fascinating and I, I uh, such, uh, such three, three great speakers uh, and sharing their stories. I guess uh, amongst, uh, there's many things to take away, but um, diversity is and is 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 uh, is incredibly powerful. Um, personal finances. I mean, some of the particulars of getting here and 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 being aware of some of those types of things when you're first here. Living virtually. I thought that was great of of encouraging people to understand what the community is before you move here. Um, be the first and uh, and bonfire and be and be that early adopter from a business perspective of taking that chance because it's it's rich and rewarding. And helping students, I think, uh, Mehdi, that's, that's in, in order to keep them here is make sure you're helping them get the things they need to stay here. And I think those are some takeaways that uh, certainly I'll be uh, um, uh, looking at. Um, and just before we do conclude, um, I want to thank once again our, our uh, friends from the Immigration Partnership of Waterloo Region. We appreciate and, and, uh, and value our relationship. To our, uh, to our great sponsors, MCAP, thank you for, for your uh, sponsorship today, and to Carol, uh, I don't know if she had to leave, but uh, the um, uh, Workforce Planning Board. We appreciate uh, of Waterloo, or sorry, of Wellington Dufferin. We um, we appreciate their support to the um, Delta Waterloo. Thank you for hosting us today, um, and to our community partners, Reception House, uh, the Y, and Multicultural Center. Please uh, do say hi to them on your way out. And of course, to all of you uh, for attending today. Thank you for your continued support in making these events possible.